Good afternoon. I'm Melissa Tallman, Marketing and Membership Director here at CPA. Welcome to the 2021 Coalition for a Prosperous America Annual Conference. Today, I'm really pleased to go ahead and present our tech and solar panel. Uh, moderating today's event is going to be Jeff Ferry. Thanks, Melissa. Hi, Jeff. How um, are you? I'm good. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Thanks. So, I'm um, I'll just do some introductions and then we'll get on to the group discussion. Um, I'm Jeff Ferry, the Chief Economist at CPA. Um, welcome to our technology panel. Some of you may not know this, but before I worked at CPA, I spent about 15 years in the technology industry as a marketing executive. And six of those years were at a company called Infinero, which makes optical networking systems. And we built a chip fab in Sunnyvale, California. I believe we are the only company to have built a greenfield fab in Silicon Valley, which there is much silicon left over there, but we built that in 2001 to 2003. It's still operational today. And so we're fortunate enough today to have um, three people from the tech industry, three leading executives from the industry, and I'm gonna introduce them. And then we're gonna hear from each of them. And then we're gonna take questions. Um, I've got some questions and the audience, you're all welcome to use the comment and chat box here on this uh, platform to send in questions. And Melissa and I will ask the panelists the questions. So um, let me introduce our guests first. Roslyn Layton is the co-founder of China Tech Threat, an advocacy group focused on the technology, technology industry in China. She's also a senior VP at Strand Consulting, a consulting service based in Denmark and focused on the telecom industry and particularly the 5G telecom sector. She's an American, now resident in Copenhagen, Denmark. She was previously a fellow at the American Enterprise Institute here in Washington. And she is a senior contributor to Forbes. She's published numerous reports on the tech industry, including most recently a white paper she and I co-authored on maintaining U.S. semiconductor leadership and countering the China tech threat. Um, Steve Papa is our next panelist. He's the founder and CEO of Parallel Wireless. Parallel Wireless is the only U.S.-based developer and manufacturer of a complete range of wireless telecom systems from 2G through 3G, 4G, and 5G. Unlike some other 5G startups, Steve's company does innovative hardware as well as software. And Parallel sells 5G systems to telecom network operators all over the world, including the US, Africa, South America, and Asia. Parallel competes with Huawei and has won deals in direct competition with Huawei. And by the way, Huawei is approximately a thousand times larger than Parallel Wireless. Before Parallel, Steve founded an early big data company, Endeka, which he sold to Oracle for $1.1 billion. Steve is also the founding investor of Toast, a restaurant billing app, which many of you probably used at a restaurant. According to the Wall Street Journal, Toast is now preparing for an IPO worth an estimated $20 billion. Finally, Steve is also founder and CEO of CanDo, a semiconductor startup that is designing chips for Parallel's 5G wireless system. Next, we have Mark Widmar. Mark is the CEO of First Solar Inc., the only US-owned manufacturer of solar modules among the world's top 10 solar equipment companies. First Solar is truly carrying the flag for US solar companies. Last year, its revenue was $2.7 billion, and its stock has gone from 33 a year ago to around 80 right now. It manufactured 2.2 gigawatts of solar panels in Ohio last year. Um, that's about one eighth of the total US market. First Solar truly illustrates the benefits of having innovative US technology manufactured here in the US. Um, we're seeing a solar supply chain developing around First Solar. Because of its presence in Ohio, suppliers have sprung up to supply First Solar. And the first new American float glass plant recently opened in Ohio. And I read in the news that Rio Tinto is close to investing $3 million in Utah to build a mine to mine telluride, um, partly to supply First Solar with its innovative thin film solar panels. So um, that's my introduction for our three panelists. I'm going to ask each of them 
to tell us a little bit about themselves, their business, and why they support CPA now. And um, let's start with you, Rosalind. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's great to be with you in the CPA audience. And I really enjoyed collaborating with you on our paper about semiconductors. It's a great entry to this uh, discussion. You know, just for me personally, I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I grew up uh, in the 70s, and I saw um, basically the hollowing out of uh, what happened with the steel industry and uh, how Pittsburgh, um, you know, completely changed and a lot of Western Pennsylvania. And um, what people weren't really thinking so much about the future at that time. And, you know, so all of my life I've been seeing hollowing out of America. I lived also in Silicon Valley, like you. Uh, I saw some of the waves of, um, you know, the dot-com uh, boom. I was there after the financial crisis. And for me, the takeaway is, you know, we've talked so much about uh, that the globalization wasn't good for low-wage jobs in the U.S. Well, it's not great for high-wage high wage jobs either. And I think like a lot of uh, uh, people in my cohort really felt um, like job opportunities very limited. I did a global MBA where I traveled and studied in India. I, I had worked for Tata for some years. I lived in China and, you know, I, I saw a lot of the, um, a lot was going on in those places. So I have constantly been thinking about how do I move up the value chain myself because American policy was all about um, offshoring everything and only, you know, maybe some software will be left. I'm not sure. But at any rate, I have founded China Tech Threat to address, which I think is a, a major challenge that we have today, which has been brought on by this belief that we should buy a lot of um, information technology from firms owned by the Chinese government. I think it is a really bad idea. It's put us in a terrible place with our privacy, with our security, with our national security, certainly has not been good for American jobs. So that is what I do with China Tech Threat is to try to bring attention um, we've seen great American brands like GE, Motorola, uh, IBM. They sold off their best assets to Chinese companies. And Americans today think they're buying GE fridge, you know, an IBM laptop, which is a Lenovo laptop. It's not American. Um, and, and so that's really a type of fraud. Um, but we shouldn't, we don't want that to happen now with semiconductors because we still have a lot of the value in the uh, chip design. And our paper talks about how to uh, strengthen that by ensuring that the advanced manufacturing is here. We also talk about on the international front what we have to do to stop the, uh, per, the, the leakage of American technology to the Chinese government and military. American companies willingly selling their products into um, Chinese military aligned fabrication companies. I'm talking about applied materials, KLA, LAM Research, selling into CXMT and YMTC. And, um, you know, that we have laws that prohibit that. And then just finally, we discuss, you know, our goals for the semiconductor industry being 50% um, of production of the chips that we need here in the U.S. We're only at 12% today, but bringing that up to 50%, particularly in the memory chip area, which is what we need for 5G, 6G. We're moving to 6G, of course. We're not going to stop at 5G and artificial intelligence and other advanced technologies. So I'm just thrilled to be here um, with these um, wonderful uh, leaders that you have, and I look forward to our conversation. Super, thank you very much, Rosalind. Um, okay, uh, Steve Papa, Parallel Wireless, tell us a little bit about your business and your views of American industry, please. Steve, you're on mute, I think. Thank you. So I started my career in the uh, in the early 90s putting Intel chips in the data center for the first time. And I watched the Schumpeterian destruction of 20 vertically integrated companies just turned upside down. I mean, you had digital equipment with 17 billion in revenue in 1997. And Intel and VMware, they transformed the data center. AWS was born from that. The very natural process of innovation and advancing the economy with that innovation, okay? So I got into wireless because I anticipated that happening the same way with wireless infrastructure. And then I was in for a rude awakening that the Chinese government's interventions supporting Huawei were distorting this very natural process, okay? Right, if you look at their initial support was for Huawei to 
you know, be a du to duplicate, right? I call it duplication capital, right? They supported Huawei with all sorts of loans and whatnot. And eventually once Huawei had duplicated, then they started innovating, right? And then I've come to appreciate what's happened over the past decade because of China 2025 is the distortion in capital flows into semiconductor, fabulous semiconductor companies. Basically, because China has been creating incentives for people to do it in China, but those incentives are for what I call duplication capital, to make duplicates of the American products, right? And then innovate, right? What that means is we've not only lost the innovation from that innovation capital that would have happened here, but we're up against the Chinese government that's you know determined to transfer all of that margin and wealth from that industry through government intervention into China, okay? So it's as plain as day to me, right? Because I'm out there day to, day to day fighting Huawei. I'm putting up sites all over the world and we're playing to win. We're not just thinking about the software. You know, we are thinking about the innovative silicon that allows us to be disruptive. And, um, you know, so the reason why I'm, you know, proud to help support CPA is we need to educate people on the difference between normal government functions of sponsoring innovation, advancing the economy versus trying to steal an economic sector from another country, right? Which is really what's going on right now. Okay, great. Thank you, Steve. Um, Mark, you tell us something about yourself and First Solar. And you may be on mute as well. There we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jeff. But maybe first a little bit of uh, background around me. I grew, I grew up in the Midwest and really during a time when there was a, a lot of um, job loss in the Midwest, whether through the automotive industry, whether through the steel industry. And, you know, I always knew in the heart of an American that we were all be able to out innovate and out compete anyone, whoever we chose to compete against. Um, but I don't feel like we were given a fair chance. And so when I started my career, I started my career in manufacturing. I've been a part of manufacturing, you know, since my initial job out of undergrad. Uh, and I've always tried to find a way, how can we ensure manufacturing compete can, can compete, can sustain itself uh, and be advantaged on a, on a global basis and a global platform. So that's part of my DNA. When I came to First Solar, uh, you know, I saw First Solar, I joined First Solar about um, 10 years ago and uh, saw it as a growth industry and an evolving technology. Um, what I loved about First Solar, was the company started as a public company a few years before I joined the company, but it was an American solar company. It was American technology and it was American manufacturing. Uh, the heart of what we do and the R&D sits here in the U.S. We have R&D, advanced R&D in California, and then we have R&D and sustaining engineering in our factory in, in Ohio. And I knew it was a platform that aligned very well to me that we were going to compete on the merits of our technology, our innovation, and our manufacturing capabilities on a global platform in an industry that had a lot of opportunity and growth that could be very disruptive uh, over the coming decades. Um, we started off with a very disruptive technology. So we did not try to replicate the technology that largely was proven and well understood as a semiconductor, which was Kristen Silicon. Kristen Silicon had been studied at a semiconductor for decades. We, we looked at it and said, well, what is the innovation that needs to take this industry forward to its fullest potential? And we saw that as a thin film technology, right? So we take a sheet of glass, we put a deposit uh, a semiconductor on top of it, a uh, very thin film, very thin semiconductor, um, a fraction of the width of a human hair. Um, we we scribe uh, cells, we bus it, we put a junction box on it, and we put another sheet of glass and we ship it out to a customer all within about four hours. That's what we do. If you look at our competition, which is Chris and Silicon, is a very capital intensive, energy intensive uh, production process that starts off with first the production of the silicon, which then involves the creation of ingots, which then goes to wafers, which ultimately goes to cells, and finally gets to a, a module. Um, we've got a vertically integrated model. Everything we do, we take two uh, byproducts. One is a byproduct of the mining of copper, the other is a byproduct of the mining of, of zinc. And we take those two byproducts and we take that and create a semiconductor out of it with a completely vertically integrated process within one manufacturing operation under one roof. Um, our, our competition is very um, fragmented in that regard. 
It doesn't allow for the capability of understanding long-term durability and performance. And one thing that we have to validate to our customers is that the modules will, will perform at the expected level for its anticipated life, which is 35 to 40 years. And the great thing about the technology is not a lot of moving parts. The sun shines and the, and the photons are converted into electrons and they're distributed to the grid. And the more we can do to demonstrate the viability of that technology, it enhances the overall value proposition. So we, st we started with a path of innovation. Um, the reality though, is that we ran into a number of headwinds across that journey. Now we can look through the evolution of the economics of the technology and when it's gone from a point of being uneconomical to lowest cost of new energy. Uh, you could look at it from a technology standpoint, which was largely looked upon as an intermittent resource to evolving to a point where it's a dispatchable resource now and actually can improve it and enhance the reliability and stability of the grid. And you can look at the markets in which it's continuing to support and evolve. So it's not just uh, electricity generation, but what can electricity do to, for electrification of vehicles or the creation of green hydrogen. So all the vectors in which we would look forward to over the last decade and a half has played out really to our strengths. The headwind that we've run in, up against though is the unfair, anti-competitive, aggressive predatory pricing behaviors that we've seen out of the Chinese. This industry started off with a number of multinationals, venture capitalists, private equity, all looking for a way to create a unique disruptive technology that would enable them to participate in a long-term growth industry. It was completely undermined by the Chinese. If you look at Chinese, their strategy was aligning to a five-year plan, heavily, heavily subsidizing industries, which creates overproduction, which then creates depressed pricing, which then allows international platforms and international companies not able to compete, which then creates a quasi-monopoly, uh, and then also creates geopolitical leverage. And it's exactly what we have today. That's what's evolved. It's what was intended to evolve. It's where the Chinese set out in terms of their strategic approach. And that's what they've accomplished. First Solar is one of the last few remaining companies that's left. We're one of the 10 largest in the world. And we're the only American left that's in that size of company. We've won and we've competed because we're different. Nobody else has a thin film technology. No one else has been able to take the innovation that we've created and replicate that on an international basis. And we also, also purposely have chosen not to procure any equipment or to manufacture in China, which would enable them an opportunity to steal our technology. So that's my background. That's the company. That's what's enabled our success. The partnership with CPA, it's, it's apparent. You, you, we, we both in our DNA are around American technology and American manufacturing. And then how do we create an, a level playing field that can let a company, and there's more companies that will evolve through cycles of innovation, very similar to First Solar, but we have to have a level playing field that allows companies like First Solar to be competitive on an international basis. Great, thank you very much, Mark. Um, okay, so um, let me start off with a question right back to you, Mark. We, um, you know, as you know, we, we put out a white paper on solar power and we, we are urging the U.S. to develop um, to move towards self-sufficiency throughout the solar supply chain. And I often get asked or that, how is this really possible? If the, China, if the Chinese government, Chinese Communist Party is going to spend tens of billions of dollars supporting its solar industry, um, and on top of that, we've got forced labor, virtual slave labor out of Xinjiang making the raw inputs. How can the U.S. industry ever succeed against this? So I'd lo love to hear you tell me and tell our audience um, why we shouldn't be despondent about this and how we can um, convert our industry into a global success story. Yeah, uh, you know, let's uh, I'll hit on that, but let's start with what what is the alternative? The alternative is to become 100 percent beholden to the Chinese as it relates to uh, our future around climate change and clean energy. I mean, that's what will happen. If we don't have a strategic thesis and intent of what we're trying to accomplish, we know what the option's gonna be. I don't think any of us wanna be beholden to an adversarial country for our future, right? So I think it has to first start with a strategy and then we have to think through across that, high, that strategy around what can we do to continue to allow for innovation? How do we create a level playing field, right? What do we need to do to help our companies invest and to continue to find ways to innovate and create new technology that can evolve forward and be competitive, not only in the US market, but on an international basis. Um, the, the concern I've had 
is that the U.S. has somewhat become a victim to solar at any cost. That all we really want to achieve our long-term energy objectives, climate change objectives, is cheap solar panels. We don't need cheap solar panels anymore. Solar panels are more than affordable. That's no longer an issue. When we started off 20 years ago, the constraint was, how do we make solar panels more affordable? Where we sit today, solar panels are a fraction of what they were even a decade ago. If you look at the price of our, our technology, it's come down about five to six fold just in the last decade. And it's gonna to continue to evolve that way. We just have to allow for the innovation to happen. We can't allow the Chinese to dump product market that stymies our, our domestic market and won't allow for those cycles of innovation. And that's what will happen if we don't find ways such as we put in place safeguard tariffs and the like. Look at the safeguard tariffs when they started off. In the first 16 months, there was about four gigawatts of new capacity. So I also want to put it in perspective, the tariffs, safeguard tariffs, the 201 tariffs have not been in place for four years. They were in place for 16 months. After 16 months, there was an exemption to buy facial modules, which allowed the Chinese a way around to dump more product into the U.S. and not have to pay the safeguard duty. So within 16 months, four gigawatts of new capacity was added. First solar added um, will be about two gigawatts of that four gigawatts. I'd love to put another three gigawatts of capacity here in the U.S. I would have done that already if the safeguard duties would have been put in place for the entire duration. But after 16 months, they were undermined with a bifacial exemption. So we had to then revisit and reevaluate our capacity expansion plan and investments that we would have made otherwise in the U.S. So my, my, my view is first, we have to start with a strategy. We have to have a long-term view, right? This is not a short game. This is a marathon that we're in right now. Solar and other renewable energy will be here for the decades to come. They're our future. And we have to have a strategy on how to invest how do we allow companies like First Solar to continue to innovate and to bring new disruptive technologies into the mix? First Solar's technology roadmap is more than competitive. We have no concerns around competing on the merits of our technology. We'll drive our technology to further levels of performance over the upcoming decade. And there's evolutions that will take the technology from, we refer to it as a single junction technology to a multi-junction technology that will create higher efficiencies than what's in the marketplace today and who can do that in a relatively short time with the right support of a strategy, an energy strategy, a renewable energy, a climate change strategy in the U.S., and the right level of support and, and a balanced level playing field that we don't have to worry about the Chinese dumping product into the U.S. market. Great. Thank you. Um, tell you what, let's come back to solar in a minute. Let's, um, let me um, get, ask a question of Steve and get a little more context on the the wireless networking market. I mean, I think it's a, a sort of similar question. How do, how can you win against Huawei, which is a hundred billion dollar company, Steve? And how does the U.S. win the battle to uh, rebuild our networking industry? You're on mute still. Again, I think I'm trying to not make noise for others, but um, the um, it's a very big topic, right? And I'm going to try to con you know. Um, there's a lot of things conflated and I'm going to try to tease out here. You know, we hear a lot of talk about semiconductors, which is semiconductor manufacturing. Absolutely a problem, which is true across the board. But in competing with Huawei, there are two other very unique problems. The first is the government financing, right? So even if I have the identical product at the same price, if the other one is providing a billion billions in financing, it's quite difficult. Right. This is the whole Belt and Road Initiative. Right. China buying influence through this, which, you know, is not unreasonable so much as they're doing it to kill other countries, industries. Right. That's that's their stated objective. The other thing that's in here is we can if you take that away, we can absolutely beat Huawei through innovation. I do not worry about that at all. OK, but we do run into the problem of innovation capital and semiconductors in the US, okay? We have a shortage of it, right? The, like it's, it's both those things. So it's one, providing subsidy to Huawei as a systems company, right? 
But in order to keep the innovation cycles going, we need, you know, we have a highly consolidated semiconductor industry in the US. The venture capitalists have largely pulled away from investing in Fabulous Semi in the US in favor of investing in China where there are government subsidies that multiply their dollars. That is the reality. I'd rather it not be so, and we'd have just a normal, you know, uh, competitive free market, but we don't. So if we want to beat Huawei, we have to arm the U.S. silicon industry with more innovation capital in small companies, not the big companies. They're very profitable big companies that have all the R&D dollars that they want. OK, but the, the lack of new capital formation in innovators is a big problem. And so if we could just get rid of the fact that China providing capital makes it hard to sell systems at scale. And then we brought more innovation capital into the country for semiconductors in short order. Huawei uh, market share would be would be shrinking. All right, good. Okay, so let me ask um, any of you um, what you you've put out some interesting ideas, thoughtful ideas about, as you say, more strategic approach. We had a big change in Washington um, at the start of the year with a new Democratic administration change in Congress. How receptive do you find um, folks here in D.C. in the government to these ideas? And, you know, Rosalind, I know you're watching this as well. I think opinion has moved on China. How has opinion moved on industry, on technology and manufacturing? Anybody want to comment on that? Hey, let me, um, but I'll, I'll make a comment on that, Jeff, but I'd also like to tie back into to what, what Steve said, and I think he's, he's spot on, right? Um, first off, the, the China Belt and Road Initiative really creates some, some very challenging competitive headwinds on international markets. And I'll give you an example. Um, in Dubai, uh, the very first project that was ever done in, in Dubai was for solar, right? It was our technology, it was specced into our technology. Our technology is unique in terms of it's it perform it, it performs very well in hot humid climates and is less impacted by soiling conditions. So generally you're going to find our technology will be superior uh, in the Middle East and climates similar to that. Um, the very first project was us. The second project was a follow on project, a couple hundred megawatts of which we won with, with Aqua. Uh, and then after that, we've largely been shut out of the market even though we got a superior technology because China's Belt and Road Initiative has brought in subsidized low cost of capital, right? That we can't have access to. We can't compete at that level. On the pure merits of its technology, we would win the vast market share within the Middle East. But because of the Belt and Road Initiative, which is also tethered to Chinese technology and equipment, we can't compete, right? So that is one way that we've got to figure out how do we create that level playing field in that regard. The other point I want to, want to mention, which I think Steve has made a great point on, and I go back to this, it's just a cycle of innovation. There's a lot of innovation that can happen, but capital to be deployed into a solar industry right now, you're not gonna find anyone that's willing to step up into that, right? The, the, the number of companies that have failed and have gone bankrupt because they had to compete with China Inc. on an unlevel playing field, there's no new capital to come into the mix. There's a, there's a new startup company in California that we're doing a little bit of work with that has some very unique and innovative um, opportunities to significantly enhance the efficiency of a solar module. They can't get capital, right? Because as soon as they have a conversation, there's no capital that wants to invest in the solar industry right now because everyone has a horror story of where they lost money, right? So unless we do something here to create that level playing field and enable that capital to, de to be deployed in innovation, we're always going to be behind the game. And that's really what China wants. China took a legacy technology, right? Like I said, been studied for decades and they just got it to scale, heavily subsidize it. And they're trying to stymie any new innovation. They don't want First Solar to be successful because we created this unique disruptive thin film technology that they know ultimately can make them vulnerable. And they don't want that. And they don't want any new technology or innovation to happen. And we've got to find a way to create that type of level playing field. Otherwise our destiny is going to be sealed for us. As it relates to the new administration, um, I, I, my friend, you look, I think they've been there. It's great to have um, a new uh, open mind approach, focus on climate change, U.S. manufacturing, um, trying to, to address the Chinese threat. Where I struggle with a little bit with really just our overall approach um, 
is we're too slow, right? You know, we know that there's a lot that can be done, but we're too slow. And, and, and we're competing against our competition that are extremely agile, nimble. And as soon as they put out their next five-year plan, everyone executes. There's no debate. There's no discussion. They go execute. And we get caught up in, you know, the, the political uh, bipartisan discussions and debates. And we got to move. We got to be faster than what we have been, right? There's easy wins, things we could do right now. If we could get everyone moving in one direction, we can't continue to delay and have to wait. Right. Okay. So let me come back with just one more question on policies. Um, you're, you know, we're talking about um, about protection from their predatory practices. A long-term tariff is one way to deal with that problem. On the other hand, um, Steve's talking about the absence of innovation capital, and I certainly agree. It's disgusting when you go to a website like Sequoia Capital or. Kleiner Perkins, and all they do is talk about investment in Chinese companies, which are sort of non-transparent to us as well. But, and we've talked about, and we're working with folks on Capitol Hill, and there are some senators out there who are very big on controlling the flow of US capital to China. So which or both of those two policies do you think would make a big difference? Tariffs or controls on the outflow of US capital into China, or both? I suspect, oh, I'm sorry, was that directed? I, I apologize. So whoever wants to take it, go okay. ahead. Um, I suspect you're dealing with the leaky sieve trying to control the capital. Like I really think that is going to be virtually impossible. Just, just, a, just a guess. When I look at the many different ways someone can to, to move things, they'll just get limited partners and create China funds with capital from other countries. Now, if you can truly control all of that and everyone really work together, maybe. But, you know, I regularly run into someone, they're setting up their fund in the Cayman Islands and people become LPs in a Cayman Islands company from offshore and then they're just investing in, in China. I think that's going to be hard. I think the tariffs, there's certainly value in that, but a lot of these are international markets, right? So unless you're getting those other countries to sign up, again, it's going to be a problem. You know, so I, you know, I do believe something that fosters innovation capital in the United States would be very valuable, right? Where there's matching, right? You get some private capital, they're getting leverage on that somehow. You would see a lot more in those targeted sectors. I, I, I find it very difficult to fight China's approach there any other way because they distort the market in a way that we have to go right at it. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do those market interventions. But if we can't stop China doing it, then we kind of have no choice or we just are enabling their plan. We're not fighting them. Okay. Okay. One comment I'll just add around that as well, just briefly, is I was on a, another panel discussion yesterday, uh, this morning, excuse me, um, with, uh, with the EU and, you know, they're, they're struggling with, you know, how, what is their strategy to go forward? Um, you know, having, you know, the birth of this industry largely started in Europe. And the technology was all stolen by the Chinese and, and all the manufacturing was moved into um, into China. The equipment was being produced in China. And now the EU has has really limited, if anything, uh, as it relates to uh, manufacturing capability or technology. Um, they're struggling with what their path forward. Now, uh, part of our conversation today was around we can focus on the innovation and there's a lot we can do to, to innovate. And we when we started off the company, Europe was a huge market for us. And, and we were creating the industry, so we had to innovate, we had to collaborate, and we had to figure out strategically together, how do we make this successful? Um, and we could do more of that. We could take that to the next level. My concern though, is if we don't address the root cause, right, which is the subsidies that are provided to China, right, that creates the overproduction, that then is, creates the dumping into international markets, no matter how far out innovate someone, I'm always going to be risked to be undermined because of the dumping. We have to create that level playing field. And then once that level playing field is there, the innovation will come. The dollars will flow. Now we can do other things to incent and to provide uh, funding for different levels of innovation. Um, we, we've got a great program right now that we're trying to work for with and with, um, with NREL and others as it talks to the next generation technology. We need to be technology leaders, right? But we also need alignment to help fund some of that innovation. But it also has to be with a backdrop, knowing that once I do innovate and create 
auction, I got international, not a U.S., but international markets, which I can then participate in and not have to worry about the excess dumping that we, we're under pressure from right now in some of the international markets or the Belt and Road Initiative and, and the like. Because unless we fix those root causes, the innovation will happen, but I just don't know if you're ever going to get it to its fullest potential. Okay, thanks. Rosalyn, let me ask you a question about Europe, which which Mark is re, or just brought up. Um, as we know, the European Union recently agreed an investment deal with China, which uh, disappointed a lot of us over here. Um, we know that Germany seems to be willing to do almost anything to sell one more Mercedes Benz in China. But on the other hand, the European Parliament now seems pretty pissed off with the Chinese government over um, Xinjiang, I think it is. So how would you characterize the European Union's views of China and what chance is there that they become more of a, a U.S. ally and partner in standing up to China? That's a great question. And I want to thank uh, uh, Steve and Mark for sharing so many insightful comments about their experience. Uh, I would say that in the last it was in the Trump administration. There was really a sea change in the view about China. It has been building. Um, you know, there was quite a bit of evidence uh, in, the, in the Obama years that China was, you know, had taken things too far. And um, it did take the, um, you know, the opinions has changed. And what I see, the same thing in the U.S. as I see in the EU, is the voters are fed up. They are tired of the policy, the way that China is getting away with murder, getting away with all of the anti-competitive practices. They they don't want it. And uh, the voters are showing it in their the way that they vote and the people who they vote for. What we as the voters are up against is Wall Street, it's the financial industry, um, uh, large corporations who don't care. They are care about their, their quarterly profits. They are not thinking about the long term. And you certainly see that in Germany. Uh, I work a lot with the German academics, a number of policy people. Um, they are they are livid about what has happened with Deutsche Telekom continuing to keep its relationship with Huawei, despite all of the um, uh, the the what we've learned about its practices. Um, you have certainly seen across the EU the uh, companies who said we don't want Huawei. They have done the rip and replace effort. And as it turns out, it has not cost them more money to switch to a non-Chinese vendor. They have not slowed down their rollout plans either. So we've had a lot of kind of made up fear. I mean, Huawei puts a lot of misinformation into the marketplace, but I, I see this as really something about consumers and voters against um, large industry. Uh, over your um, two days, you've had so many amazing uh, commentary from people. The part of that's missing, which I think CPA can bring to the table, is the, uh, of course, you have, you know, you have a, a labor, you have a lot of uh, firms, but it's consumers. Um, I have experienced myself across the EU, people don't want to buy the Huawei phone, even if it's cheap, it's a great phone, they're tired of it. And you can see the, um, uh, that once they're educated, they don't want to be part, they don't want to buy labor that has been made by people in slave camps in Xinjiang and so on. They, they don't want a part of that. So there is a, um, this is going to take the political leaders in Washington who can uh, do what is right, stand up for what the voters want, courageous people who are willing to stand down what, you know, the, in, the investors and what Wall Street wants. And, you know, to, so I think that that is the, the missing piece here. We know what's wrong. It's finally as voters to demand the policies that we want and enforce the laws that we have. China is blatantly doing illegal things. The international organizations that are supposed to stand up and prosecute it don't do their jobs. So, uh, and we also have a lot of, um, we have a lot of policies, our own laws, our agreements with other allied nations around combating this behavior. We have to enforce those rules. So there are things that we can do. We don't have to be, um, you know, just, to, it's not a fait accompli, it's not over. Uh, we don't have to throw in the towel, but it does mean we have to stand up and be strong. Thanks, yes, good point, great. Um, Steve, let, let me ask you a question about U.S. manufacturing. Um, as you know, I uh, worked for Nortel 20 years ago. At that time, Nortel had 40,000 U.S. manufacturing employees. Lucent had, I think, a similar number back then, 20, it's only 20 years ago. We have members of CPA who, 
who were suppliers to Lucent and Nortel and Western Electric as they were in, in the early days. Um, what, today we have virtually zero manufacturing of networking equipment in the US. What would it take to bring back manufacturing of networking equipment to the United States? So I think we need to recognize that things do change, right? Where, you know, if you were to look at um, the amount of content in a car at its peak in terms of the number of suppliers that one might have, and then look at a Tesla with a flat screen taking over all that dashboard content, okay? So the siliconification of a lot of stuff is very real. So if I look back to when I started in the data center and we had a plant in South Carolina with 500 people building data center servers, okay? The content of something the size of a refrigerator is now all in a single pick pack, uh, chip package, right? So a lot of that does change. So it's really about bringing the fabs back more than anything else, right? There, I mean, if you look at the supply chain, I mean, the content of a you know, high-end 5G network infrastructure, if you look out two years, the whole system is really a PCB with a bunch of chips on it in a chunk of aluminum with a piece of plastic on the cover. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little, but that's pretty much what it is. Something that would have been, you know, several refrigerator sizes of content back in those Nortel days, okay? So, we are starting to draw attention to the most fundamental piece, which is the fab capability. We could decide if we want PCB manufacturing, right? There's pros and cons of that. People worry about there is a lot of chemicals involved in that. Can we do that in a environmentally friendly way in this country? Not that it's good that someone might be doing it in an unfriendly way somewhere else, right? You know, those are enforcing global standards on we can't just be putting toxic junk out everywhere, right? So it's not going to be the same just as you're not going to get back the folks who used to make all those mechanical gauges on a Chevy in the 70s, right? It's a piece of silicon and a touchscreen at this point, okay? I mean, as you know, the shortages from TSMC right now are crippling the global auto industry. That is one of the repercussions of that. So much of what used to be a widely distributed network of suppliers building physical objects have been consolidated into a silicon die, okay? So I think the focus on the fabs, absolutely right. We can look at, I mean, there's the, the chip sacks being discussed, they're going into the packaging and even PCB pieces, but that's what most of that content is for networking equipment at this point. You know, the metal, I mean, I'm on the board of a company called Desktop Metal. We're doing 3D metal printing, building production systems that we can have here in the United States that will allow us to competitively produce even the metal parts of this relative to what's done in China. Okay, good. Mark, how about manufacturing on your side? You've got a, a good story, I think, on U.S. manufacturing. I mean, I was thrilled to hear of a new float glass plant because that's a, a, great, a great manufacturing. It's a high-tech way of making glass, isn't it? So tell us a bit more about the manufacturing supply chain in the U.S. that's uh, supporting um, for solar, if you would. Yeah, first off, like I said, it is our DNA. We're a technology and manufacturing company. Um, and we we have a high level of confidence in our capability of, in the U.S. To, to compete on a manufacturing basis, really around anywhere else we can manufacture on a global basis, especially here to support our largest uh, prime market here in, in the United States. So um, we made an investment, you know, we made a decision, a difficult decision, um, about uh, four years ago, where we completely disrupted our technology and jumped not just one evolution, but two evolutions forward with our product. Um, as a result of that, we had to we had to wind down the production in all of our existing manufacturing facilities and then retool them. There's a lot of times people will go down that path and they never come back. Right? We made that journey, we made that decision, and we've come back with a with a great innovative product that now is thriving and that we're sold out across all of our factories and we're adding more capacity one of the places that we did add capacity to was in in uh, our factory in perrysburg so we've tripled the output of our factory uh, in perrysburg added a new facility um, and added um, 500 new manufacturing jobs now when you look at the actual jobs on the manufacturing floor, you really have to cascade that through the entire supply chain because it becomes a multiple as you think about all of our suppliers. 
we generally want to locate our supply chain close to our factories and glass in particular is extremely important. If you really look at our product, it's two sheets of glass and an aluminum frame, you know, the, the thin film deposit, you know, the um, semiconductor gets deposited on the sheet of glass is, is a very small component of the overall cost of the product. It's really two sheets of glass and the aluminum frame. Um, so we want to localize the supply chain. So one of the things that we made a decision to do when and we worked with our a glass supplier partner is to put a new flow glass uh, factory in the U.S. And I think Jeff, as you alluded to, it's the first one that's really been put in in about 40 years um, because that industry as well has been devastated by the Chinese. Um, but they can create a unique substrate glass that has properties that are ideally suited for what we need. Um, and we've partnered with them to leverage their capabilities with us, co-locate a factory that's very close to where we are, um, reduce inbound freight type of costs, but then work more strategically. We have quarterly operating uh, rhythms with them and we talk about quality, we talk about performance, we work together to figure out ways that we can further enhance the technology that creates value to us. So having that local supply chain in partnership and collaboration for us is really important. Um, and they've got the capability to scale with us. So they've also made an investment, as, as I indicated, we're in the, uh, in the process of making commitment around further capacity uh, here in the U.S. They enabled that when they made their investment so they could grow with us. We knew we were both were going to grow. And so that enables their success. Now, that also enables their success to their suppliers. So it's cascaded now into the glass suppliers, right, who also then will benefit from the incremental production here in the U.S. So the ripple cascading effect of, you know, one manufacturing job, right, one module going out the door cascades itself into multiples of that, dozens of new jobs that can be created in the U.S. Um, now, the technology has evolved, right? And there's also leverage of, of automation that has happened. So there's no doubt about that. Um, so automation is helpful in that regard. And it's not helpful because it just all, also manages the overall cost of the production. But our concern and constraint where we sit today is as we grow is, and I think with there's more reshoring into the U.S., it's, it's the overall workforce and the skill set and the capability of the work, workforce, not just the direct labor, but even the uh, the engineering workforce, right? If you think about the engineering workforce that we're going to need to allow for the reshoring of more manufacturing in the U.S., we're not where we need to be at this point in time. And also, we're somewhat, because of this um, expansion of work from home, we're starting to even see some of the high tech companies starting to hire our engineers that are in Ohio, allowing them to work from home. So our even competitive landscape now, who we're competing for with technology, isn't just say a, a local geography or close to the facility. It's now being expanded really across the U.S. in terms of who we're having to compete with. So I, I'm highly bullish about U.S. manufacturing and our capability. I am concerned though about skill set of our workforce to enable what needs to happen. It's something we have to, as a nation, um, come to grips with, and we have to put more investment in training into our students and undergrad and graduate students around engineering skill sets in particular. Okay, thank you. Let me um, just quickly give you a, one follow on question, which I bet you get from Wall Street investors all the time. The cost of a manufacturing employee in the US is around $25 an hour, according to the government data. In some of these other countries in Asia and even Mexico, it's it's you know a fifth of that. Um, does, is that a handicap for you? How do you justify manufacturing in the U.S.? Do you think U.S. Manu do you think the U.S. has a future in manufacturing, given that labor cost differential? Is my question. Sure. No, no, I really do because it, we also have a much more productive workforce here in the U.S. than we do in, in our international factories, as an example. Um, and plus, we also are some of the more uh, material handling, material movement and the like, we're leveraging uh, automation for that now. So we don't have to worry about, you know, that workforce. We've been able to drive that to a lower cost, more cost productive uh, point than we would have historically. Um, you know, we've got our facilities are about 1.2, you know, um, million square feet. They're very large facilities. Um, the front end of our manufacturing process is largely automated, but does require a very, you um, technical skill set, an engineering skill set, manufacturing engineering skill set to help manage and operate the front end of the manufacturing process. And then we look across the back end of the process, which there's more of our direct labor content and leveraging that with automation and we capture a more productive workforce as well. So I have no concern. And the other thing, just to put it in perspective, I think this will continue to evolve. Being close to your domestic market is important. 
And if you look at what's happening with uh, the cost of international freight right now and the challenges that a lot of companies are having to deal with, and, and basically you've got an oligopoly of a handful of large uh, ocean carriers uh, who are holding everyone hostage around freight. And then now, as most of you know, there's a, 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 a carrier that's sitting sideways in the Suez Canal right now that's backstopping everything, right? So I, for me, being close to the domestic market, not being held hostage to the cost of the freight, leveraging the automation, leveraging a more highly productive U.S. workforce, all that lines up to success. All right, great. Um, you know, you mentioned education. I think that's a subject um, we in technology think about a lot. Um, I wonder if anybody else wants to add anything about, you know, the two kinds of education. There's engineering education, which I think we need more of in the U.S. And then on the manufacturing side, I actually think we're, we're sending too many people to college to study irrelevant subjects and need to um, have need to both increase the number of manufacturing jobs with good pay and also in, have the educational system direct people into those jobs. But you, you, I'm wondering if anybody, any of our panelists have any thoughts. Rosalind. I, I do. You know, the, um, the Trump administration had a proposal to merge the Department of Education and Department of Labor into the Department of the Workforce. And what, um, you know, besides, I think, reducing the government bureaucracy, um, you know, which itself is quite a large uh, entity, but just that notion that, you know, what is education for? Is it an assembly line itself? Are we creating a workforce for America? I think that that notion was the right idea. And I've seen that myself, you know, I, I teach in a university, I teach in an engineering department in uh, at Alberg University. It's one of the world's best uh, engineering, engineering schools. Um, but I will say one of the things that other countries do better is apprenticeships. And you're absolutely right. Not everybody is cut out for a four-year degree and two-year master's degree and a PhD and the rest. But we need a better job with mentorships and apprenticeships and also trade schools, which um, you can actually make a great living doing um, a, a lot of new things. So uh, that is one area where I'm I have not yet seen what the Biden administration's education policy is. Um, you know, I know that there's a huge social component to it. I'm not sure what uh, amount of workforce is there. I'm anxious to see what that would be. Um, but, you know, nobody has monopoly on these good ideas. Um, there have We have been studying this. Every party has tried to fix it. Um, I think there's a real problem. We I think you even mentioned it yourself, Jeff, in the STEM paper, something on the the other challenge that we have is that um chinese nationals will come and study in in, in u.s universities they'll uh, make up 15 percent of the students that may be great that the schools get the tuition but those students go back to china they take um they they uh they're not necessarily screened we can see through the department of justice some of those students have uh, have been uh, involved in espionage so that is an issue um this is a really important area if that we need to uh, recover and restore if we want to have uh, a long-term uh, we talk about innovation that is a huge part of it so um you know I, i'm sure that the other gentlemen have some thoughts on it as well but yeah how, how about you steve uh, i i suspect you have some thoughts on education you did after all go to one of the best universities in southern new jersey I um, so the, the, you know, it's not just education, it's also cultural, right? So I have, you know, R and D in, I don't know, six or seven countries. Okay. And the, you know, some of the technologies we work on, they're not that like wireless is not valued like in the United States as much as it is in some other countries, for example, you know, we, we you know, AI and machine learning is the, you know, I, I like to say that's what the cool kids like to do right now. They're all rushing to do that. But you go to a country like Israel where they recognize they're in an economic battle, right? With their you know, neighboring adversaries, okay? And they pursue the technologies that are gonna equip them best for that economic battle. And here in the US, we don't, we don't show that, you know, pursuing this broad-based STEM, right? Is really valuable to the country, right? We try, but it's not really getting through, right? We're more interested in social media and all this kind of stuff, Hollywood, which is an important industry for the country, but it's not the sort of stuff that's gonna advance us as a society, you know, and we gotta get the cultural values there as well, right? China does that extremely well. You I mean, we, it's it's stereotype, right? But it's, 
But it's true. I mean, they know that that's the route to advancing their country. Every one of them knows that. Yeah, I I agree 100 percent. A lot of cultural problems in the, the state of America and the state of the U.S. and the, the deeply divisive political debate that prevents well, and us it's from the, coming. It's a late stage wealthy country. Those are the effects that you got to fight and you have to be doing things proactively to fight them. It's no different than when you build a company, you take it public. People are feeling wealthy. They're not working as hard. They're not as focused. They're distracted. We have that at the country level that we need to just inject a sense of urgency that if we want to advance society, if we want our children to have a better society than we have today, right? We kind of dropped the ball the past 30 or 40 years where people took it for granted that this is just going to happen. It doesn't happen, you know, on its own. We have to do intentional efforts to make it happen. It's not an right. entitlement. Okay. Totally agree. Um, as a closing question, we've got five minutes. So I would just say to um, each of you, um, you know, we, we tend to get gloomy when we talk about uh, the, the global challenges facing America. But how do you feel personally about the future, the next several years for yourself and your business? I'll start. I, I want to say CPA has made me feel very optimistic about the future. I think that you guys are doing a great job. You have, you're gathering a lot of different stakeholders. You are making the right, you're communicating with the right policymakers. Uh, you are doing the research that you need to do. So I feel like the, the U.S. is still in the game and that also um, we're not alone in the sense that uh, there are other countries who also uh, suffer under some of these same issues and that we can build a critical mass. Thank you very much, Roslyn. Anybody else? Mark, do you want to give us a sure. comment on the future? Yeah, you know, when I when I look at it just on the merits of where we are as a company and, and technology roadmap that we have in, in front of us and uh, the unique value proposition that we can create and with the disruptive technology that we have uh, on on the merits of what we have and what's in the walls of which we can control I'm, I'm very optimistic and excited for for the future where, where I become more concerned is just how is not just the US but how globally are we going to address um, the egregious behavior that we're seeing from the Chinese and the abuse that we see at many different levels if we in the U.S. or in other parts of the world aren't willing to step up, and I do get worried about they have the geopolitical leverage that China is creating and what they're doing with their Belt and Road Initiative in particular, um, and really holding people hostage and beholden to what China wants to do. I mean, look what's happened between China and Australia right now. China and Australia tries to step up and, and make a few, can have express their views and concerns of not only what happened with with uh, COVID-19 but in other areas and they're immediately there's immediate backlash against Australia and putting tariffs on goods coming into the country uh, embargoing or not taking delivery of uh, materials coming from from Australia and so they're punishing them and I think the the future that we'll all have as a as a nation and you know as a, as a global uh, society is going to be beholden to Chinese the China and we have to step up now. And if we don't get in front of this, we know what the what the future will look like. And so when I look at our company and our technology and our 7,000 associates that we have and what we've done to best position the company for long-term success, I'm very excited and very bullish. I, I am concerned on the other dimensions though, as I, as I, as I mentioned. And, and we gotta take a leadership position here in the US. Let's, let's lead by example and then let have the other nations follow our, follow our leads. I'll just build on a little bit of Mark said and put a finer point on it. So I feel very good about my work in 5G and the potential to disrupt Huawei's dominance globally. I see it happening. I see the path to get there. It's clear as day to me. But where I worry is in the same way when you look at um, industries, like you get large established incumbents and they start becoming internally focused instead of externally focused on the changing competition. OK, they squander their time, they squander their resources until it's too late. And you mentioned it, Jeff, our divisive politics. I look at how much energy we spend on stupid stuff. I'll give you an example. One of my other companies I launched is actually voting machines. 
voting systems. We're trying to fix that problem. We're actually trying to, because I got involved because I thought it was important to democracy. And then I look at all of the energy that went into the past few months in that stuff. If instead we directed that energy to the actual adversary, not ourselves, right? We would advance and make progress, but we don't because we're doing a lot of stupid things. We're internally focused, just like when you deal with a very large company, right? And they only know each other in the company. They don't know who their competitors are. They don't know who their customers are. They have their own internal ecosystem. And that's what we're facing as a country right now. Yeah. I think Steve right. just Steve just described Innovator's Dilemma by Clay Christensen. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> You're, ab you're, you're describing what I went through at Nortel. We had five vice presidents, John Roth, all fighting for the CEO's job. It was bitter and it was horrible. And five years later, the company went bankrupt. So we've got to learn from those mistakes and unite as a nation and build a US economy that works for all 350 million of us. Okay, well, it's 1.30. Thanks very much for a very interesting conversation. I'm thrilled that you could make it, and I hope the audience had a good time, and um, we'll look forward to seeing each of you again. Thanks, Steve, Mark, and Rosalind. Melissa, yeah, it's over to day. you. Thank you, everybody. Right now, we're going to go ahead and take a half-hour break. We'll look forward to seeing you at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time for our next panel on trade and tariffs. Thank you.